actually funded part of my travel here via the internet, some, uh, what they say, crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing. And this is one of the things that the don donors are getting in return is a video of me. So uh, they'll probably be very grateful for that. And, and I wonder what uh, Elul would say about the whole situation. <laughs> Knowledge of history, then, 
and of the thinkers of the past, and of their thoughts, and of the transcendent uh, uh, narratives that rationalize their worlds. These seem to be part of the Lowell's conception of a humanist education, along with the theoretical imagination, the development of critical thought, and the value systems within which to make judgments. He differentiates between the critical spirit formed by higher education and the exclusion of independent thought. And so a critical spirit then appears to be a goal of education in Alul's conception of the institution. Finally, Alul tells us that education and instruction no longer have anything gratuitous about them. They must serve efficiently. And so, once more, we can assume that, uh, that Alul also believed that a proper form of education is gratuitous, uh, unwarranted, unjustified by circumstances, pursued not for any particular useful end, but for its own sake. Not merely an instrumental end, but an end in itself. So what sort of tentative conclusions can we draw from a little few remarks on the subject of genuine human education? I believe he's telling us that education should be a humanist process undertaken on the individual level by a rational being focusing on the human heritage of thought and tradition and subjecting these to our critical faculties. And I would like to call this a liberal education. And I'm not alone in this view. Uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, in his uh, The Idea of University, also differentiated between what he called useful knowledge and liberal knowledge. Liberal knowledge, uh, Newman tells us, is inherently good and end in itself. Newman described the effects of liberal education on the student as being a habit of mind which lasts through life that engenders freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation, and wisdom. And he boldly proclaimed that this is the main purpose of the university in its treatment of its students. Uh, Newman's observations are relevant, I believe, to Ilul's critique of education in the technological society. One form of education focuses on the material world as perceived by the senses, the imminent world and orients us towards a particular goal or, goal or end of education. How to do something and how to do it most effectively and efficiently. The other focuses on the immaterial world as experienced by the imagination, the transcendent world, and orients us toward profoundly different ends. The question of why we might do something, the consequences of our so doing or not doing, uh, and the universal categories uh, within which we make our ultimate decisions. Again, one is geared toward practicality and utility, the other toward questions of ethics. One form dwells firmly in the realm of material reality, the other in the realm of things unseen. One orients us toward, uh, toward measurable values of efficiency, speed, productivity, cost effectiveness, etc. The other impels us toward immeasurable values of truth, justice, freedom, equality, and the good. Well, this gets us to the problem. Today, academics in the United States, at least, are being told that a transformation is underway in higher education. This transformation is commonly explained by two major factors. One, cuts in state support for higher education, and two, increased competition from non-traditional educational institutions. Universities have become dependent on tuition due to decreased external funding. And in fact, at this moment, nearly half of the national average institutional cost of educating a student in the United States is paid for by tuition, up from less than a quarter in 1988. Today, roughly 71% of all U.S. graduates finish their schooling in debt, and their average indebtedness is now close to $30,000. Furthermore, the addition of new technologized education platforms, online universities, uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses, and all, all the like have only exacerbated the situation by drawing students away from traditional colleges and universities, making those institutions even more tuition dependent. At this moment, in alarming rhetoric, we in uh, American uh, higher education uh, are being told by administrators and boards of trustees 
that academia is in an existential crisis which demands executive action without regard to the wishes, needs, or aims of faculty or students. In response to these systemic economic problems, university administrators all across the country have introduced, with surprising consistency, sets of policies that, that contain a number of curiously similar items. The elimination of tenure, uh, diminution of faculty's role in shared governance, the remediation of something they're calling cult, uh, curricular stagnation, and an increase in faculty productivity, the control of costs, etc. Uh, I argue that the responses to these problems constitute a free market model of higher education, a top-down structure of bosses and workers, a commoditization of information that mirrors the technological society, that focuses not on the needs of students as citizens and people, but on the culturally derived desires of students as consumers and future functionaries of the free market. The technique of this free market approach is called, and it actually exists, Total Quality Management, or TQM. TQM arose in U.S. industry in the middle, middle of the 20th century and has, in the last three decades, been applied increasingly more frequently to higher education, not only in the U.S., but globally. TQM shares a lineage that goes back to Frederick Taylor's scientific management theories, and its core characteristics include the following. One, the imposition of a top-down approach to management. Two, a view of higher education as a service industry. Three, a view of students as customers. And four, the view of an education as a commodity, a thing you buy. Uh, the word quality itself in total quality management it, uh, poses a problem. Uh, what is it and how do we measure it? Uh, the best functional definition I could find for what this term means to managers applying TQM techniques comes from the Federal Quality Institute, which states that quality is, quote, meeting the customer's requirements the first time and every time. Uh, what the customer requires, of course, is a function of the free market and is itself a subjective phenomenon vulnerable to the very sorts of techniques that Lowell describes in his propaganda. Uh, it's easy to see how the application of a technique like TQM, as well as the ambiguous use of the word quality, can easily tip the balance of educational content away from what Newman called liberal knowledge and Lowell refers to implicitly as humanism and toward useful knowledge or technique. Uh, I want to focus for a few minutes on what I believe is one of the most significant and troubling aspects of TQM in higher education, and that is the idea of the student as a customer. To see the student as a customer is a very different thing than seeing a student as a human being in a process of self-formation. Indeed, such a view assumes a fully formed consumer Within a clear, with, with a clear, already established sense of the meaning of the term quality and a precise benchmark for making judgments about that quality and what we mean by quality in the first place, who is prepared to make choices of a single commodity from among a number of commodities. In this case, we're talking about choices that may and probably will have profound consequences for the rest of the student slash customer's life. Uh, in this context, the idea of personal discovery disappears, as does the sense of interior investigation or exploration. What is relevant to the student cons uh, consumer is based prematurely on an incomplete data set founded on limited experience and mediated experience of the world and instantly measured and, uh, and, and uh, influenced by market tech by market research, sorry. To respond to the demands of uh, the student customer, it is necessary to adopt further market techniques, as it is in the nature of markets to be not only dyna dynamic, but volatile. Curriculum and pedagogy are no longer important factors in educational quality, or at least not to the extent that they are inflexible. Nor is the quality of faculty scholarship. 
Recruitment and retention become key areas of administrative attention and activity. And many colleges have embarked on non-academic construction programs to provide entertainment and leisure activities to address the demands of student customers in a competitive market. A 2013 study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States shows that market pressures results not in investment in academic quality, but rather in consumption amenities. For example, food courts, spa-like athletic facilities, and elaborate performing arts centers have become increasingly common on, on college and university campuses. The idea of student as customers, as customers also implies the university's need for constant market attention. This means increased reliance on advertising and public relations. One way that colleges and universities have found effective to keep themselves in the public eye, usually for several years, is once again the construction project. And since the 1990s, U.S. colleges have been engaged in what many call a building boom, with construction spending doubling between 1994 and 2015, peaking at $15 billion in 2006 and leveling off at $11 billion in the last several years. Much of this construction work has focused on sports facilities, uh, uh, since student customers also seem to want to go to a school with a big formal athletics program. We've witnessed a rapid and dramatic increase in spending on athletics in U.S. colleges in, and universities, particularly in the last 10 years, averaging roughly 30%. Average spending per full-time equivalent student athlete increased 48% between 2003 and 2011. Institutions with pre-existing athletic programs are expanding them, and 38 colleges without football teams uh, have added football teams since uh, 2010, with another eight expected to field new teams this academic year. Uh, uh, another recent study reports that in the uh, academic year of 2011-2012, public two-year colleges spent $467 million on athletics. Private four-year institutions spent more than $5 billion, and public four-year colleges and universities spent $8.3 billion, and that's a lot of money. The net result of the student as customer stance has been the transformation of higher education in the United States uh, from an academic experience based on individual learning, inquiry, and self-discovery into a mass-marketed social and recreational experience based on consumption and the values of the technological society. Uh, it is sometimes said of draconian approaches to what appear to be intractable problems that the cure was worse than the disease. In the case of the supposed ex existential crisis in U.S. higher education and the resultant application of free market techniques as a, as a solution, it may be appropriate to say that the cure is the disease. Um, it would be logical to assume that with all this going on, the per student cost of education must have risen dramatically during the same time. But the fact is it hasn't. Uh, faculty salaries across the United States have remained flat over the last decade. So where is the money going? Uh, 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 faculty salary barely matches the rise in the cost of living. In, in, instead, uh, it seems to have gone to pay for many of the new policies and practices and administrators suggested by the mandates of TQM theory. Uh, and now, this is not a partisan argument in the United States. In fact, it's an argument that you barely hear in the United States. But conservatives and progressives alike who are aware of this problem agree that universities are suffering from a problem which has been called administrative bloat expending the resources devoted to administration significantly faster than spending on uh, instruction, research, and service. And this comes from the very conservative Goldwater Institute, a group, uh, quote, committed to expanding free enterprise and liberty. So even the political right in the United States sees a problem with uh, uh, the administration of higher education. In the system of higher education characteristic of the technological society, the management class will proliferate 
and the control of meaningful information and communication at the institutional level will rise. In the last 40 years, the number of administrators has risen by 85%, and the number of staffers required to help the administrators has jumped by a whopping 240%, all without faculty <coughs> input. Non-academic administrators and support staff now outnumber professors and departmental uh, clerical staff. Is there any way I wonder, to imagine that these changes have constituted improvements in higher education in the United States. There's certainly change, and radical change in fact, but improvement. What benefits have we seen in higher education as a result of the introduction of these free market techniques? What have the costs been to education, particularly to the humanistic or liberal view of education as a process of formation? Uh, now, Elul describes in his book, uh, uh, The Technological Society, a number of characteristics of technique that I believe bear on the problem of free market technique in United States higher education. I'm going to just touch on a couple of them in the interest of time. Uh, if anybody is interested in reading more about this, I do have copies of the paper, and I'd be glad to give them to you, because they wait a lot. <laughs> and I'd have to carry it along. Uh, the first is rationality. Uh, higher education administrators, of course, are not evil, stupid, perverse, or insane. Uh, their, thinking and, their thinking and their behavior are consistent with the values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors of our culture, American culture, and more broadly, the technological society. It is a perfectly reasonable, rational assumption to make uh, in a highly competitive, commercialized environment that all societal institutions labor under the same constraints and must apply the same responses. Uh, this point of view seems to settle matters for most people, but it ignores the fact that colleges and universities historically have had a different mission and method than business. And it also begs the question of why in the last generation this has changed. A school may need revenue to operate, there's no question about that, but that doesn't make it a business. At least it didn't make it a business in the past. Historically, the university has been a place of debate, controversy, agonism, and discovery. It was the environment par excellence, and that's about the extent of my friends, uh, uh, of intellectual ferment. But as Lull observes, the most rational instrument possible takes no account of the extreme diversity of the operational environment. And free market techniques like TQM are quintessentially, quintessentially rational. And to de deny this, especially in conversation with an administrator, marks you as a radical and perhaps a dangerous person. Uh, another one is automatism. Partly because of its rash uh, rationality, technique becomes its own ideology supplanting and making irrelevant all previous ideologies, uh, uh, ideas, values, and ideologies. When, techni when technology allows something to be done, it satisfies the logic of technique. It is rational. When it proves itself to be efficient, it satisfies the values of technique. It is righteous. But what are we doing, and what do we mean by efficiency? These are questions unasked within the boundaries of technique, because within these boundaries, the answers seem so self-evident. What we can do and do efficiently, uh, we must do. And finally, uh, universalism. Uh, TQM has been in, uh, you know, that wasn't finally. Finally, I wanted to talk about autonomy, the autonomy of technique in this uh, uh, context. Uh, what power, I wonder, does anyone have, student, faculty, administrator, trustee, to correct the problem I've described in this paper. Wait, do we even see this as a problem? In his remarks about the autonomy of technique, uh, perhaps the most controversial claim of his critique, Alol opened himself up to charges of determinism. Charges, I believe, by the way, are poorly informed and ultimately false. Alol believed, that, uh, believed in the essential freedom of the human will to make decisions, but simply warned that our abdication of responsibility with regard to values, our failure to think critically about the reality uh, that we have made, uh, our, our failure to question it and to resist what is wrong, must ultimately determine the course of our future. 
However, the technological society has stacked the deck in its own favor and against us by presenting a reality within which we learn and develop and consequently whose values become our own. The ability of, uh, of, of the human will to make free choices in such an environment is greatly reduced. Resistance appears less like a principled stand focused, uh, founded on individual commitment to genuine and hum humane values than it does like nostalgia, sentimentalism, and bloodism. Yet, in spite of these constraints, I chose as a theme for this paper resistance to the incursion of free market technique in higher education. And I confess to you right now that I don't really have a plan for this. I have no, uh, there's no agenda, there's no plan, no campaign that I can share with you that outlines the parameters or methods of resistance. I can only tell you what I try to do. And I try to do whatever I can do. I speak. I speak to faculty as well as students, I write, I teach about the problems I believe I see in our society, I challenge especially my students to question their own assumptions about reality, I goad them, I prod them, I annoy them, I expose them to the work of thinkers, scholars and writers who present uh, us with realities other than the manufactured re uh, reality of the technological society. Jacques Lull is of course Prime amongst them. Neil Postman is another. Harold Innes, yet another. I force my students, and they've told me in those words, they're forcing them to read, to think, to question, and to debate. Most of them hate this. A few, a few find their minds open and actually sometime come back and thank me. I also, however, go and prod and challenge my faculty colleagues uh, to question the direction in which higher education is moving right now. Not just at my institution, which it is, but at institutions all around the United States. Uh, and for a very brief example, I recently proposed to our faculty senate a resolution which voiced some of the very same concerns I've expressed here and put them into the record for both faculty and administrators to read. Not surprisingly, my proposal was quashed in committee. It never made it out of a closed room. Uh, and, like I said, I do what I can. Uh, there's little else I can do but give witness to what I see. And I'm comforted by Lowell's thoughts on the situation of the powerless freedom of the individual. He said, uh, what I have just said doesn't sound very efficient, of course. When we oppose things which are too efficient, we mustn't try to be even more efficient. So, uh, it, in, in conclusion, I would like to see higher education conceived of once again as liberal or humanist. I'd like to see uh, a recommitment in higher education in the United States, the idea of the university as an educational institution dedicated to the formation of enlightened, critical, and curious young people, rather than and adjunct to the marketplace. Like quality, progress, and improvement, education is another word whose meaning right now is up for grabs and is dependent on who is using it and what the intentions of the speaker are. It's up to us as educators to define the word, I believe, and I'm hopeful we'll define the word in such a way that it liberates our young people rather than preparing them to be effective, productive, and efficient functionaries of technique. It is ultimately up to us to choose who we want to be. Merci.